Hi. So today, we're going to start a new chapter, chapter four, on the wave properties of matter. And it's really an introduction to quantum mechanics and where the foundations of quantum mechanics are. And it all starts with this guy right here. He was a French aristocrat, actually a prince, um, Louis de Broglie. He lived from 1892 to 1987, so we're getting into recent memory. I was born in 1975, so I can remember 87 anyway. Um, he originally studied history, interestingly enough, but then he switched fields and went on to become a scientist. Um, and he was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1929 for his prediction of the wave nature of electrons. So basically, his idea was relatively simple. He said, well, if photons, if light can have wave particle duality, then why can't matter also have wave particle duality? And he postulated that this um, wave would be this, basically the same wavelength as the wave for a photon. So the wave would be equal to Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds, um, divided by the momentum of the particle. Uh, and of course, we're here using the momentum as the mass times the velocity, h over mu here. So it's a very simple idea. The fact that since photons have a wave and a particle nature, that maybe matter also has a wave and a particle nature. But this simple idea is the foundation for quantum mechanics. All of it. Okay? The wave nature of matter is really the reason that we have quantum mechanics. And almost everything about quantum theory is based on this wave nature of matter. It's really hard to overstate how important the idea of the wave nature of matter is to modern physics and to quantum mechanics. It really can't be overstated. This is super important. So that's why I have it in bold and in red. This wave nature of matter is everything. It dictates quantum mechanics. The ideas there will unfold over the next several lectures. Now the deal is, this wasn't noticed before this, this epoch this time because the wavelength is a really small value. For example, if you have a 4,000 pound car, you've got a mass of about 1,800 kilograms. And if you're driving at 60 miles per hour, that's about 27 meters per second. So plugging into de Broglie's equation, h over mu, you've got 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds divided by 1800 kilograms divided by 27 meters per second. And that gives you a wavelength of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 38 meters. Now, compare that to the size of a hydrogen atom, okay? It's about 8 times 10 to the 27 times smaller than a hydrogen atom. And it's definitely teeny, teeny, teeny compared to the size of the car itself. So you wouldn't expect that for everyday objects like cars and people and cats, right, that you would be able to see this wave nature because the wave nature is too small for, first of all, you to see with your eye or any other kind of decent measuring device. And second of all, for large objects, it's just way smaller than the size of the object itself. And so you have yourself classical physics when things get big and heavy. But let's say now that you have an, an electron, which is teeny teeny, and you accelerate it with something like 30,000 volts. This is really easy for me to do. I do it every day um, in the electron microscopes on the second floor, for example. All right, well, the speeds that it would achieve after being accelerated with about 30,000 volts are about 100 million meters per second, all right? So if you plug that in to uh, de Broglie's equation, h over mu, then you get 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds divided by the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms divided by its speed, 100 million meters per second. Then you get a wavelength on the order of 7 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Now this is still small, but if you compare it to the size of the object itself, the size of an electron, as far as we know, electrons are pretty much point particles. Well, the wavelength then dominates because it's larger than the size of the object itself. So it matters a lot more for teeny tiny things. All right, well, as soon as you have a new idea, a good idea in physics, you need to test it experimentally. No idea is um, safe until it's been tested and tested and tested and tested. Well, one of the first rounds of testing of the wave nature of matter
was done by these two guys here, Clinton Davison and Lester Germer, and they did their experiments at, at Bell Labs in 1926. And their idea was pretty simple. If particles have a wave nature, then under the correct conditions, they should exhibit these diffraction effects that are very easy to see in light. And so what they did was they measured the wavelength of electrons using their diffraction from a crystal of nickel. And this provided the experimental confirmation of matter waves that were originally proposed by de Broglie. So their experimental setup looked like this. They had a filament, basically, and they passed a high current through the filament. And then the um, matter in the filament, probably tungsten, got uh, really hot. And because of the heat, there, were, there was enough energy to eject the electrons from the filament. This is called thermionic emission. Then once they came off the filament, they passed it through a little pinhole and accelerated it um, with a voltage of 54 volts. So they gave it a little kinetic energy. The electrons then struck a nickel target, and then they were diffracted by that nickel. Um, and then the intensity of the diffracted beam was measured at various angles by a detector whose position could be variable and moved along an angle. So the idea looks like this. Let's say that you have x-ray diffraction, okay? An x-ray diffraction, you have an incident beam of x-rays come in and reflect off the target, and then the other beam comes in and reflects off the next layer down from the target. Well, the idea here is very, very similar for the electrons. It's actually the exact same. The geometry is just a little different for Davison and Germer's original experiment, but the theory is the same. So here you have your incident uh, beam of electrons, and they strike one atom, and they're reflected off, and then they strike the neighboring atom, which is really super close, and they're reflected off. Okay. Now because these two beams of electrons that are reflected off neighboring atoms are so close together, then according to everything we know about waves, they, the neighboring waves should interfere with one another. All right. So if the x-ray equation here is 2d sine of theta is equal to n lambda, as we show here, as we talked about before when we talked about x-ray diffraction. If you can vary the position of your detector and the detector is located at some angle phi from the incident beam, as is shown here, then you should also get interference due to the path length difference between these neighboring beams. And the path length difference here is d sine of phi. And then you set that equal to m lambda. Okay, So that's the condition for um, constructive interference for neighboring electron beams. So, like I said, the geometry is a little different, but the concept is basically exactly the same. You have these neighboring beams of electrons that interfere with one another and create constructive interference, okay? Specifically at some angle phi that, it's, uh, that constructive interference occurs at. Now, they already knew um, the nearest neighbor spacing of the atoms, D here, for nickel. It was 0 0.215 nanometers, and it had been measured independently, probably by X-ray diffraction. So what they saw when they plotted their data, now if you look here, each point on this plot represents the relative intensity of the electron beam when the detector was located at a corresponding angle measured from the vertical axis. Okay, And then they plotted it all out. Okay, You can see here the phi is actually measured here and shown. And you can see that there's a maximum in intensity at that angle phi is equal to 50 degrees. So that was the results from their experiment. Okay, so we can use non-relativistic equations for our electrons here um, because the accelerating voltage was only 54 volts, so they weren't going super fast. All right, so let's figure out what equations would describe this. We're going to take our kinetic energy, one-half mv squared, for our electrons. And uh, in case you hadn't heard, one-half mv squared is the same value as the momentum p squared divided by two times the mass. You can do a simple little quick algebra thing if you don't believe me on that. But you can also set the kinetic energy equal to p squared over 2m, which is equal to one-half mv squared. Okay, so our electrons have this kinetic energy, and the kinetic energy that they've got is uh, 54 electron volts because they're electrons and they were accelerated through a potential difference of 54 volts. Okay, so if then the momentum is equal to the square root of 2 times the mass times the kinetic energy, just rearranging this p squared over 2m equation equal to the kinetic energy to get that. So p is equal to the square root of 2mk. And we know the mass of the electron is 511,000 electron volts per c squared. Okay, we're going to use those units for the mass of the electron.
So you have 2 times 511,000 EV per C squared, and now times the kinetic energy, which is 54 EV. And when you take the square root of all those numbers multiplied together, you get a momentum of 7,430 electron volts per C. Okay, now we're going to plug that momentum into de Broglie's equation, lambda is equal to h over p. Um, to make the math just a little simpler and keep these cute little units, EV per C, I'm going to multiply the top and bottom of this equation by C. So basically I'm just multiplying by 1. And then I get lambda is equal to HC over PC. Okay, well you can plug in for um, HC. Um, a fun little unit thing that maybe you should prove to yourself, H times C is actually 1240 EV nanometers. Okay, and you can get that by using H is equal to 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15 EV seconds, switching those units over to EV, and then multiplying times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, but then shifting the units over from meters per second to nanometers per second. And you'll end up, when you multiply those two things together, with 1240 EV nanometers. And now we're going to divide by PC. Well, PC would be um, 7,430 EV for these electrons in the Davison-Germer experiment. And then when you divide those two numbers, 1240 by 7,430, you get 0 0.167 nanometers. So that's the theoretically predicted wavelength of the electrons um, from de Broglie's equation. And then <clears throat> they used the results from their experiment with the maximum at 50 degrees and the spacing of nickel being the known spacing of nickel, 0 0.215 nanometers. And they arrived at a, um, a setup that way for their wavelength of 0 0.165 nanometers. And so those two numbers agreed very well. And the de Broglie's description of um, electrons having waves was a success. All right, so that's the Davis and Germer experiment that was carried out in 1926. Now, this idea that um, particles can be used um, and diffracted off of materials has been exploited ever since then. Electron diffraction, for example, is still used to characterize crystalline structures and materials. Lots of transmission electron microscopes and some scanning electron microscopes have the ability to measure the electron diffraction pattern, and then you can use uh, the structure of the electron diffraction pattern to identify unknown crystals. So, for example, um, here's some of the electron diffraction um, pictures from some cobalt, um, aluminum, nickel, various structures shown there. And these are used to figure out what your unknown sample is. Let's say that you have a rock or some kind of unknown sample and you stick it in your electron microscope, you measure the diffraction pattern, and then that diffraction pattern is characteristic of a particular crystalline structure and you can use it to ID materials. And this is done all the time. Usually you don't have nice single crystal structures though. Usually you have a polycrystalline film. And then the patterns aren't quite so beautiful, but you can still see concentric rings and you can get known spacing of the rings. Okay, and that's shown here. Um, this is a TEM image of a diffraction pattern. So that's pretty cool. You can use it all the time. Now this idea of diffraction of waves, uh, matter waves, is an interesting idea and it adds on to our wave particle duality. We already talked about how light has wave particle duality, that you have a particle, the photon, but it also propagates like an electromagnetic wave as predicted by Maxwell. And so now we're going to add on to that. There's the principle of complementarity and that states that the wave and particle models of either matter or radiation complement one another. Neither model can be used exclusively to describe matter or radiation adequately, but you kind of have to think of it as a whole. It's not that light is a wave or a particle. It's a wave and a particle. And matter, correspondingly, is not a wave or a particle. It's a wave and a particle. And which aspect of it you see depends upon the experiment that you're doing at the time. So we've introduced ourselves now the idea of a quantum particle. This quantum particle is a new model that's a result of the recognition of this wave particle nature of matter. Entities will have both particle and wave characteristics, and what experiment you're doing dictates what kind of behavior that you're going to see. But it's a mistake to think 
that matter is a wave sometimes and a particle sometimes. You really should think that matter is a wave and a particle all the time. And what kind of experiment you do dictates what you see in that experiment, the wave or the particle nature. All right. I hope that that uh, made things a whole lot more interesting um, for you, a whole lot more confusing, really. But that's physics.